what is the personality myth? This goes back to the idea that you might just think like, I really want to kind of have like more friends or have better relationships with my colleagues or, you know, I'd I'd like to improve my social life, but I just don't have the right personality to do that. It's kind of fixed. It's ingrained in, you know, in who I am and I can't change it. And the research just shows that's not true. So you can have these kind of interventions where you get um, people you just encourage them to be more sociable um, over like a one or two week period. And it doesn't matter how introverted or extroverted someone was, everyone benefits and feels a lot better from having tried to connect and just like push themselves out of their comfort zone a little bit more. Similarly, you know, lots of people go around feeling like their shyness is just something they can't overcome, like like they just believe they, they don't have the social skills and they never will do. But um, when you change that mindset, when you get people to realize that actually that anxiety they're feeling isn't, you know, it's it's something that you can overcome with practice. Like just changing that belief helps them to cope better with those new social situations and actually makes it much easier for them to develop the social skills they want. Um, So the conclusion really is just, you know, no matter what your personality is, like your brain is malleable, your behavior is malleable. Um, if you want to build like a, a new social life for yourself, like you have that potential to do so. So in this study, how did they encourage these people to become more social? Is it just a matter of just try to be more social? Like what are, I guess, the ways? Because I'm sure people can relate. Oh, I feel a little shy, a little awkward. And like, yes, it may, it may be possible to change, but how? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great point because actually... Um, I think, as we all know, just having a kind of vague intention um, often isn't (laughs) enough. Like, you know, you need to, it needs to be concrete. Um, So, you know, there are lots of behaviours that we can do, but um, kind of the first step is just to have what we call implementation intentions. And that is a kind of um, concrete plan for something that you're going to change about your behaviour. So it could just be that, say you're like a real, like, dog lover. And you could just be like, um, decide every time I see someone with a cute dog, I'm just going to approach them and like ask them a couple of questions about their dog. Uh, Just be brave enough to kind of just strike up a conversation and see how it goes. Or, you know, like if you're a fashionista, you know, next time you see someone who's dressed in an amazing way, just tell them that you really admired their dress sense. Um, Or, you know, you could be more altruistic, like, And decide every time you go to the supermarket, look for someone who's struggling to carry their shopping and just offer to take it to the car. So just really small steps, but that's what the research shows. Like finding concrete ways that you can do. Yeah, and because it's just, it kind of gives you fewer excuses, actually. If you've already told yourself, I'm going to do this in this particular situation, um, people are just much more likely to enact that. And, you know, once you start doing that, like if you do it kind of daily, that's when you see this really rapid change over the course of a week where suddenly, you know, all of your fears of the conversation being kind of super awkward and difficult, they just kind of evaporate because what you find is that, you know, those fears are so often unfounded and actually the conversation is really pleasant, people are warm, no one's, you know, it's very unusual for people to be hostile to you because most, more often than not, they would actually prefer to have more social interactions in their lives as well. And so they're really grateful to you for giving the opportunity and for having taken that first step. Right, right. It's funny because everybody needs social interaction. And then I guess there's two types of people. Some people are open to it and then other people just want to be left alone. Don't talk to me because they're so introverted. So do you have any thoughts on that? So I think like we have to be really sensitive to like people's kind of the signs they're giving off. Like, I think if someone's, you know, reading, like really intently reading or listening, you know, they've got their headphones on, they're obviously like in their kind of own little world. Like, I don't think, you know, it's like advisable really to start talking to them necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to respect people's privacy. Um, But what the research shows in all of these studies is that, you know, we really expect people to respond badly when we try to strike up a conversation because we just think like assume that people do want their solitude. But actually like having like a bad reaction is really unusual. And the 
what the psychologists have done is they've they would kind of engineer these situations like on like commuter trains in Chicago, where like the participants' task was to kind of strike up a conversation with a stranger and then to give a a kind of questionnaire to that stranger and say, like, could you contact the researchers to say how you feel after <laughs> this interaction? Uh-huh. Um and what the research shows is that, you know, the strangers often feel better for having mm. had that interaction as well. Okay. So bad reactions, very rare. It kind of helps everyone. Like the person you're speaking to is probably more than likely going to be grateful for the conversation and you feel great for having the conversation too. Right, right. So I guess the lesson is don't assume that it'll go bad every time. Like it actually goes well more often than not. Yeah, exactly. That's the big kind of psychological barrier here. It's just that we are like pessimistic and we don't need to be. Like we could be much more optimistic. What other concepts are your absolute favorites to talk about from this book that you think everyone should know? There's something called the appreciation gap or the gratitude gap, which um, is kind of similar to the liking gap. But I think it is something that we can all enact really easily. And it's another one of these ways that, you know, if you're feeling shy, like, I think this is just such a good first step. Um, essentially, we, you know, a lot of us just think, like, really good things about the people around us all the time. Like, we really admire and respect them and are grateful for kind of how kind they've been to us or, you know, how creative they are or, you know, all of these, how generous they are. But we just don't express those thoughts. Like, and we have these kind of negative assumptions again. We think that the other person's going to feel really awkward if we compliment them or they'll kind of consider that we're quite clumsy as we say the compliment, like we, we don't have the trust that we're kind of competent enough to say these kind of words like elegantly. Or we think they just kind of know they're great. Like right. they don't, we assume they don't need us to say. And all of those assumptions are wrong. Like actually we just underestimate how much it would mean to someone to show more appreciation. So that's why it's a kind of gap because we just don't recognize how much they Uh, They want to hear these words from us. And all of the kind of fears that we have about kind of not being able to do it gracefully, um, you know, no one's judging us on that. They, People are mostly just um, concerned about the warmth of the sentiment. They don't really care if you say it in a slightly kind of awkward or goofy way. Like, you know, I'm sure sometimes that just makes it even more charming, actually. And, you know, like we, you might think, oh, but won't it get a bit wearing for them if, if we're like complimenting them? kind of every day even but the research shows that actually no like people love every time you say a compliment people love it even if you do it like every single day for a week people feel just as good at the end as they did at the beginning when you say that compliment so you know this simple moral of that kind of story is that we just we can afford to um to show appreciation just so much more than we do and it's a great way of just cementing this bond with other people and a lack of appreciation, you know, it's so much a uh, cause of like, um, you know, when friendships break down, when marriages break down in the workplace, it's the kind of one of the biggest reasons that people leave their jobs. It's one of the biggest causes of burnout. And it's so unnecessary um, when, you know, often we're biting back our compliments and actually we should just be more open with them. Yeah, like there, there's so much more benefit to giving more compliments than there is like holding it back. You shouldn't hold your compliments back if you have something nice to say. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so um, it benefits the other person and it really benefits you too. And it can even, you know, we were talking about the health benefits of social connection. Well, actually, just this one social act can help to soothe your physiological stress response. Like you giving the compliment? Yeah, exactly. It suits your response? Yeah, and the other person. So it's like a win-win for everyone. Um, There was this study that replicated kind of Shark Tank, you know, that TV program. And with pairs of participants, they just asked one of the participants to compliment and um, say a few words of gratitude to the other participant. Um, And what they found was when they were giving the presentation and when they were coming up with the idea and giving the presentation, like both of the participants the expressor and the receiver of that compliment, both of them like showed a more, a healthier, more optimum stress response. So they were kind of energized, but they were not going into that kind of panic, fight or flight kind of state. They were, they were just using their kind of nerves to their advantage. Wait, so how, how do they measure this? <laughs> like, tell me more about the studies. 
it's relatively easy to measure people's um, stress response because you can just like um, measure things like people's blood pressure okay. and the uh, kind of heart rate, heart activity. And essentially when people go into the fight or flight response, you see that the vessels at the kind of peripheries of the body are kind of constricting. And again, it's because you're expecting to be kind of injured by a predator or something. So you're like moving the blood kind of more centrally into your body so that you avoid blood loss at the um, kind of in your limbs. Oh, is that why people's hands get cold when they're nervous? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Mm, okay, I see. But if you have a more kind of optimum stress response, it's like your heart might be racing a little bit, but actually like all of those blood vessels are nicely dilated because it's more like you're kind of in a race. Um, and, you know, the blood is also like being pumped to your brain to kind of energize your thoughts and to kind of give you more energy. So yeah. stress in itself isn't, you know, necessarily a bad thing. It's just when you go kind of tip over into that fight or flight response, that it's kind of bad for your health. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, so you're just saying all of this stuff, the social, like the complimenting, the like all of this is really related to our physical health. Yeah, exactly. It's just so fundamentally related. Um, you know, there are even studies just on like the common cold where people would like go into a laboratory and be deliberately infected with the virus. Um, and you could predict who was going to develop the infection just from like measures of like how much social support they felt wow. in their life. Yeah, like how well connected they were. Yeah, like their immune system is a little stronger if they have social connection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of stronger specifically for like to get into the kind of nitty gritty is stronger um, to fight against viruses because mm. if you were living in a big group, infection of like respiratory disease is much more likely. So yeah, that's why is kind of primed to fight kind of all of those infections, yeah. Oh, I see. A lot of this stuff, to me, it, it feels like I know it to be true, but it, I think it's nice hearing the science back it up, that people have been doing these studies. 